Now here as we move into the fifth segment of this structural geology course, we want to get to the down and dirty of specifics. So we're going to spend a little more time talking about a little bit less so that we can really understand it. And what we're going to talk about is regional jointing. And today we'll talk about a couple of the settings we might expect to see certain kind of jointing in and why. Now, before we get started, we want to remember that when we look at an outcrop and see a whole bunch of complex jointing, there's probably not one easy explanation about why it looks that way. Now, even if that jointing took place in the same event and at the same time, its orientation is probably adjusted based on local stresses, which is something that you're going to see in heterogeneous rock. The stress everywhere is not going to be the same. The strength everywhere is not going to be the same. So you're going to have stress fields that change with space, even in a regional event that has a certain orientation. So joints are usually an interesting mystery that are going to take some serious investigation to explain. Now, first, we are starting this on the premise that we've already talked about Griffith cracks, micro cracks, imperfections, the ways that joints form under tensile stress, the orientation of our sigma 1, 2, and 3 relative to the joint surfaces that we see. And uh, if you haven't looked at that, you might want to go review it. That way you have a good understanding of where we're going next. Um, in this section, we'll briefly talk about uplift and unroofing, sheeting or exfoliation joints, and natural hydraulic fracturing. These are some common settings in nature that you're going to see some interesting joint sets that may need interpreting. Now, first of all, during your uplift and unroofing, which is what we'll go over first, you experience a number of different things that contribute to the formation of joints. And joints that you're going to see here are typically vertical, and we'll see that's because it's horizontal tensile stress that typically builds up in these beds. Now, we're all pretty familiar, I think, with how rocks uh, go from much deeper to shallower. There's tectonic events that force them up. There's the mere erosion of overburden that lets them come up. There's a lot of ways that they come up, but what, what happens is no matter how they got there, there's going to be a serious strain change in the stresses that are acting on them. For one, and most simply, the overburden that is removed is going to reduce the vertical stress acting on those rocks. So one of the first factors um, that has to do with jointing is your cooling and contraction. When you have cooling and contraction, which you're going to have, because keep in mind, there's a thermal gradient that says the core of the earth is very hot, the surface not so hot, and in between it has to have some kind of gradient. That's not a linear gradient, but that's a subject for another day. What we do know is if it's deeper, it's hotter. When it comes shallower, it cools down. And with, as with most things that cool down, it wants to contract. So you deal with some contraction. Now, in the vertical direction, contraction is no big deal. It's free to shrink because the free surface of the Earth allows it to. However, if it wants to shrink in the horizontal direction, it's going to have some resistance because it's bedded with other rock that is not so excited about shrinking. So that contraction or that desire to contract is going to build up one of the horizontal stresses that begin to pull apart and cause jointing. Another effect that is often part of this is the Poisson effect. That has a fancy name, but it's a pretty simple concept. You see, typically when your rock is released from the great stress that is, is on it from the overburden, in a vertical direction, it actually wants to expand somewhat, a kind of elastic reaction to uh, uh, come back from the contraction that's experienced under stress. Well, the Poisson effect says if you want to expand in one direction, you've got to shrink in another direction. And conversely, if you want to push down on something and compress it in one direction, it'll expand in the other direction. Well, when the rock tries to expand vertically, again it wants to shrink horizontally. And again, it's not allowed to freely because it's not uh, contracting from a free surface, and there is more horizontal stress that is built up in that rock. And finally, you have the membrane effect, which is interesting and something that I hadn't really given much thought to, but when a rock is brought shallow, in effect, another statement we can make about it is that it is moving away from the Earth's core. And so when we're talking about a sphere here, 
as you move away from it, your radius is going to get larger. That means that to fill the same space, this formation has got to thin out a little bit. So it is stretched like a membrane as it moves away from the core of the earth, and we call that the membrane effect. And notice again, that's going to try and stretch it horizontally and build up a horizontal tensile stress. And because a tensile stress is a pulling away kind of stress, what it does is reduce the uh, confining pressure that is normally keeping joints from forming. So if you have your sigma 3 in this direction because you have more stress coming down than you have this way because this is pulling away and creating um, less compressive stress, then you're going to have vertical joints form in these beds. And that's what you're going to see here. You're going to see typically vertical joints, and you can call it on these forming characteristics. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is sheeting joints and exfoliation. This is something you typically see in rock that's not bedded. It's not schistose. Remember, we talked about schistosity being the thin, platy layers. Um, so. Often you'll see it in igneous rocks that are uh, exposed at the surface, and you'll see it in some sedimentary rocks like, say, sandstone that doesn't have uh, schistosity. Um, what this is is tensile joints that are actually formed parallel to the surface of the earth or to the local topography. And since tensile joints form in the direction of sigma 3, and we know that there's usually overburden stress, at first, we might be a little uh, confused as to why joints would form in this way. Well, you are right to feel that way. They only form par parallel to the surface when you have a situation where horizontal stress is going to actually exceed what you've got coming down on the overburden. And so that creates an environment where you can have sheeting or exfoliation. And there's a couple of ways that that can happen. First of all, you can have horizontal stresses that are tectonic in origin, um, but more interestingly, you can have intrinsic properties of the rock that may hold residual stress. In a sedimentary rock, let's just imagine a sandstone, we have all these little clastic grains, and as it becomes buried, they experience some elastic compression um, because of the overburden. Now, they have this residual stress, they want to pop back out, but as they're buried, let's say, water starts flowing through the formation and out of solution comes precipitate cement and you have a sandstone. Well that cement is not going to hold any residual stress. However, it did cement all those grains together that do have residual stress. So when that sandstone is exposed at the surface, when the overburden stress is taken away, they are going to have a differential rate of elastic decompression as the grains are going to want to burst back into their original shape and the cement is not so worried about it and that creates an environment of residual stress. In igneous rocks, this is often affected by two things. Uh, first of all, you have the differential thermal gradients that uh, exist between the country rock and the intruding magmatic uh, pluton that closed at a much higher uh, rate than the rock around it or it cools down at a much higher rate. And so as it cools, it, it's going to create a differential stress in the pluton, in the magma, and in the country rock that it's cemented to. When these are exposed at the surface, let's say that differential residual stress creates uh, an environment where the pluton wants to contract more than the country rock. Well, it's going to want to pull away from the country rock, but it's cemented. It's not quite able to, and so that stress is going to allow for exfoliation that is parallel to the contact of the pluton and the country rock around it. And also another thing that lends to um, these layers of exfoliation that peel off like an onion is uh, the differential crystallization. Um, as this magma slowly, slowly cools, certain crystals freeze first and so each layer, because of course the outer layer is going to cool fastest that's in contact with the coolest rock, but only certain minerals cool at those temperatures. So you're going to have a differing mineral composition as you move inward in the pluton, and that allows surfaces of differential composition along which you can have exfoliation jointing.
And the third situation that we want to talk about, one of the most interesting for geologists and useful, especially for economic geologists who work in petroleum or even uh, geologists that work with aquifers and water, is natural hydraulic fracturing. And um, I know you've all heard the term, and we can do artificial hydraulic fracturing by increasing the pore pressure by injecting more fluid into the rock. But in natural hydraulic fracturing, it's just about the same thing that happens. Basically, this occurs when the tensile stress at the tip of your crack that's trying to propagate, and that's here, exceeds the compressive stress of your grains plus your pore pressure, because both of those stresses create the compressive or the confining or closing stresses. So how does that happen? Well, first of all, the pore pressure in the crack is not greater than the pore pressure here in the pores surrounding. And it doesn't have to be for hydraulic fracturing to occur. What's interesting is that when more fluid is injected into this formation, the tensile stress is going to increase at a greater rate than the pore pressure, which holds it cl closed. And so it's going to help the tensile stress exceed the total confining stress. Now, how, you ask, is that going to happen? Well, as the pore pressure is increased, the grains that are cemented together in, say, the sandstone are not able to move out of its way, so they undergo some elas elastic compression. What that does is absorb some of the stress being applied. However, in this crack that is trying to propagate, there are no grains to undergo that elastic compression. And so the pore pressure, in a relative sense, increases. And so at the tip of this fracture, it's allowed to propagate. And so that's an interesting property of hydraulic fracturing that can help you make a judgment call on what to do with a particular formation, because you're going to know the properties, the elastic properties of the rock that you're talking about. Now, these hydraulic fractures are often marked by many arrest lines. Remember, we talked about arrest lines when we talked about plumous structures on fracture faces. And that is because the pore pressure increases, there's some propagation, the pressure is alleviated, and then as more fluid is injected, it's allowed to propagate again. So this usually happens in stages. And this is just a good thing to understand. Now, I think with these three situations, we will wrap up this section, and I will see you next time.